This is Amend and Progress, your go-to podcast from Vidori for all things promotional material review. Get ready for actionable insights, valuable perspectives, and best practices to elevate your workflow and team morale. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Amend and Progress, Vidori's podcast about the material review process. I'm your host, Annalise, and today we're going to be doing a real-time analysis of promotional review data to both uncover insights and sort of walk through how organizations can use this type of data to drive process improvements at their organization. This episode is excellent for any type of life science organization, whether you're just starting out with promotional review process data or have sophisticated programs in place. This is going to be relevant for anyone that's interested interested in this data or looking to improve your process. I do want to note at top, this is going to be a more visual episode than others to date. So we are going to be using visual cues, visual aids to sort of present the data and walk through this together. And so while, of course, you're welcome to listen to the episode if that's your preferred channel, I do encourage you to check out the video on YouTube as I think that's going to be the best experience. Okay, to the good stuff. Joining me today in the conversation is Jesse Horrell, VP of Customer Success at Vidori. Jesse, welcome to Amend and Progress. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you here. Although you and I getting on video to talk about data is not necessarily new. You joined me quite a few times last year when we did the Benchmark Symposium video series, and you and I got on and talked about our benchmarking data and all sorts of fun stuff there. So um, kind of a familiar story for us to get on and talk about data, which we do uh, very regularly as we are sort of the folks behind the benchmarks report at Vidori. So thanks for coming on Amended Progress. Just so excited to have you here. Could you please just give the folks at home a couple, just a brief overview of sort of who you are and what you do at Vidori? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my role at Fedori, as Annalise introduced, VP of Customer Success, I oversee um, everything for our customers post-sale. So onboarding onto the initial products um, and really supporting and driving success with the product um, throughout your, your lifespan with us. And really as part of um, our program, we are very data-driven and our team references data a lot. We help customers understand data, make use of it, um, help drive decisions uh, improve their processes, improve the use of our products within their organizations. So this is all very centric to our role um, and uh, anyone at custom, anyone at Vidori who's customer facing. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So I'm super excited to get into this. We've never done sort of this like real time analysis of the data together. And of course you're the expert here. And so really excited to dig into this today. But as you know, we start with some easier questions just about you, just to give the folks at home a little sense of who you are. So are you up for some easy getting to know you questions? Yeah, sure. Okay. Awesome. My first question is what is your morning beverage of choice? Oh, definitely coffee. Okay. Um, I would say that I used to be a little bit more of a coffee snob, but um, as I've gotten older, I've really started to um, just prioritize having the coffee done in the morning. So I do the whole grind the beans at night, put them through the filter and set it so that I can wake up to the smell of a freshly brewed coffee. And then um, I take it with a little bit of milk. Amazing. There is something to be said about like having it brewing when you're waking up and that like aroma is already filling your house. Like there is something so comforting about that. So totally understand. Okay. Next question. What is either your current or favorite hobby? Mm. So um, I have a five-year-old, a three-year-old and three-month-old. So I would say uh, I don't have a lot of time for hobbies right now as, as they're taking up quite a bit of my free time. Uh, but I will say that when I'm not chasing them around, I have been getting into golf lately. So um, that's a longer hobby, which of course is challenging with three kids, but uh, mm -hmm. we do try to sneak away when we can and, um, and play. How fun and a lifetime, lifetime hobby. You know, this one you can always have sort of something you're working on. So that's excellent. We'll have to play golf sometime. I'm not good at all, um, but I love It's just so fun to be outside, honestly. For sure. So yeah. we'll have to do like a Vidori outing at some point. Okay. Final question. What is one productivity hack or best practice you use in your daily life? Yeah. I mean, I think it's everyone probably uses lists of some format. And so I'm definitely a subscriber of lists, but uh, the digital one that I use is called Todoist. And I like to have this because it syncs across all my devices. At any point, if I think of a to-do, whether it's work or home life, I just add it to the list and kind of get it out of my brain space. 
But I will say the other hack that um, I've been trying to follow lately is if something takes five minutes or less, just do it and don't add it to the list because actually the mental load of all of these things adding up on your list can be overwhelming too. Mm -hmm. And if you're not sure how much you can get done in five minutes, I would encourage you to set a timer on your phone and realize like, oh, I can actually unload the dishes or send that email or do that thing. And it only took five minutes. So just making sure you have a, a real understanding of, of time and how much time something takes can really help you be productive and, and take a few things off the top of the list every day. Absolutely. I love that. And I'm sure as a mom of three littles, the power of five minutes, you are like mastering this like five minute just to get anything done. So I love it. I think I want to try that because I think the mental, there is something to be said about that mental load aspect of just like continually adding to the list. So I love asking that question because y'all are just improving how I work. It's awesome. I like get to walk away with all these great best practices. So, (laughs) well, thank you so much for entertaining those questions. That was super fun. Okay. So I, give a really high level overview of what we're going to be covering today. Analysis of, you know, promotional review process data. Could you better describe this for me, please? Like what really are we taking a look at today? What types of data? Let's just set the stage a little bit. Yeah. So today um, we've pulled out um, some slides um, from a broader, deeper presentation or or, uh, summary of a data analysis. What we're going to cover today are some key high-level metrics that give us insight into this company's overall quality of their MLR review process when compared to industry benchmark data. And then we're going to drill down a little bit further and look at things like workload distribution, really understand the health of that process and the people that are supporting it. Um, Bottom performer data, um, both on the submitter and reviewer side and what we mean by that. Um, and really, again, this is an example of a real analysis that we did. And so you can kind of see the, just the different paths that the data led us down. Amazing. Let's get started. Where would you like to start? Yeah. So if you'd like, I can just pull up the slides, um, and then we can dive right in. Let's do it. So an overall table kind of of this company's general key performance metrics for a number of months, September, October, and November. We roll that up and see their average, and then we've compared that across Fedori's benchmark data for teams of a similar size. And really, there's really no specific recommendations here given this data. This was sort of just like the initial look at everything to see how everything was going. You know, I would say the the one thing, the couple of things that jump out to me are that, you know, they're really close to the benchmark. So if we look at the average job duration kind of rolled up at 16.7 days, that's pretty much right on par with the benchmark of 16.9 days. The um, average days incorporating feedback is also a little bit faster than benchmark, um, but the average circulations is higher. And the average review duration is also a little bit longer. So these are not necessarily like red flags, even yellow flags, but just things of note and things that we might be interested in digging in further. Do we typically look at this type of data from a quarterly perspective or like what is your recommendation at like the cadence or the number of times it's best to sort of like look at this data and roll it up and compare it against the benchmark? Any general guidance or does it kind of depend on the organization? I would say it kind of depends on the volume of job data because you 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 don't want to be looking at something on a monthly basis if you only have five jobs that, you know, really wrap up in that month. Mm -hmm. Uh, But as long as you have some scale and some volume to really normalize data where averages and medians are valuable, then I would say any time horizon is is actually fine. I don't really see anyone go like more frequent than monthly. I think monthly is is a good like low end. Um, And then, yeah, I think quarterly quarterly roll ups are nice and. And obviously there's always a semblance of, you know, comparing this to the prior period and or the prior year yep. at the same time and kind of seeing how, how the data is trending as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. All right. So this is just sort of the general, we're laying, laying the land here. This is just sort of like at a high level where the benchmarks are. So where do we go next once we sort of see this general batch of data? Yeah. You know, I think from there, you as I mentioned, you kind of do need to let the data inspire you and to use what you know about your organization to dig deeper. So again, start with the high level metrics and see where things are. If things are wildly off benchmark or wildly off your internal target, 
I think that's a great place to start to dig in further. I think it's important to remember that no matter how good the metrics look, and even if you are performing at benchmark, there are always opportunities to uncover. So don't stop here. Um, but again, it is sort of organization specific, goal specific and data specific to figure out where to go to next. If you have no clue, I would say that if your organization's large enough where you could slice this data up further, that would also be a good an interesting place to start, right? If by brand, if by business unit, if by um, geography or product line or product manager, you know, any cohort reporting on the, these same top level metrics um, can be really interesting just to try to see where in the organization are maybe the averages being driven up or down by various like parts of the the organization and depending on how it's structured. Sure. Okay. And then I would say like also a very common um, dig down analysis is by functional department. And so anyone that has a stake in the review process, you know, really to see how those departments are performing against one another. And we'll get into that actually a little bit. Okay, great. All right. Take us along. Where do we go next? Okay. So yeah, let's move forward and we'll kind of show um, you know, some examples of what, what we looked into. This is a, you know, I did mention um, trend lines are important to, to check in on. Um, and so what we did here was we sort of juxtaposed the volume of jobs that were getting uh, completed um, against the time it was taking to complete them. And unfortunately, in this case, we saw sort of an inverse relationship that even though the volume of jobs was going down, month over month, the time to complete them was going up. So that's a little bit puzzling. And really, it could just mean, it could mean a number of things, right? There's no explanation here. Um, it could be that in September, you know, the organization was really focused on speed and p folks had more time to rally behind that goal. Um, and maybe that was relaxed for future months. We don't know. We don't know the dynamics of this particular organization, but if this was our organization, there would hopefully be an explanation for this. But this is just always interesting to see, you sort of plotting month over month, a trend check to see how things are trending up or down um, month over month, quarter over quarter. Well, I'm, and I'm sure too, if you know, you're know you the organization whose data this is, it's a nice layer on top of maybe your experience reviewing of like, or if you're the marketing person who submitted this content for review, you're like, you know, it felt like in November, things were taking longer to get through review. Well, then you have sort of this layer of data on top of you know the job volume. And so I, it's just like helping to tell the story a little bit more instead of just, it felt like, or it seems like, it's like, no, there's actually hard data that we can look at to sort of like contextualize what that experience was and have conversations as a team around why and what was going on. And to your point, like what were the other things happening at the organization? So it's just, the data helps to tell that story, right? And I think that's so often like really helpful in talking through process improvements with teams is that like, let's look at the data and have that really objectively tell us what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's move along. So here on this slide, what we're showing is an illustrative um, reviewer speed and sort of workload distribution breakdown. Um, there's a lot of observations noted here, but basically, there was an interest by this organization to understand how many tasks, you know, per functional group that were getting completed. How was that uh, spread across all the folks sort of who could be doing that work or who are eligible to do that work from a system perspective? And really what we found here was that um, there were a couple of groups with very long average task times. Um, or I should say like a little bit longer than the average. So the overall average being 2.4, um, you know, there was quality regulatory eking a little higher than that number, of course. Um, and, you know, interestingly enough, across the regulatory and legal group, there was one individual performing almost 50% of the work. So despite there being 10 regulatory reviewers with licensed seats to this platform, <laughs> one person was doing half mm. of the work and there were two other primaries that were, you know, coming in at about 15% of the work, but then there were a number of other reviewers basically not doing any tasks. And so this is just interesting, you know, could be interesting to bring to the organization to say, did you know, is this intentional? 
Um, do we want to spread this out more? Um, and again, if it's your organization, you have the context to understand if that's intentional and if that's appropriate. But from an outside perspective or someone just purely looking at data, it sticks out as an anomaly, right? Because for the other groups, things are distributed evenly or semi-evenly across everyone who's who's sort of in that group in, in the system. Mm -hmm. And I imagine this type of data would also be helpful to make a case for additional resources. You know, if there's one person within a group or a department and, you know, that's where things are taking more time because of course it's one person and that workload is maybe unreasonable. That's some data that the team can use to understand like both the workload allocation distribution and then have a discussion around resources. Should that be, you know, applicable to the organization? So there's so much good stuff that I think the group based data can really reveal. I think it's like a really fun set of data to look at. That's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, I think that the next steps from this would be to consider smoothing out those mm -hmm. resource applications and to ensure that review teams are appropriately sized and structured and, you know, again, intentional based on the organization and its goals. Um, I think that if the, you know, the organization was to, you know, maybe not be aware of this, one thing that they could think about is, oh, wow, we do have some single points of failure. I mean, even among even among the brain and content groups, you know, where this is, from our understanding, intentional, um, these are single points of failure. And that's not right. always good for process either. Mm -hmm. um, so, so maybe prioritizing reducing that or creating some resource redundancy and some cross-training um, is good for the organization to consider in this case. Of course. And, you know, my mind goes to... Also, you know, for those that are submitting the content, having awareness of like, oh, wow, I guess I didn't realize that when I'm submitting content for this group's review, it's really one person. I think that just opens up some channels of communication around like how much time, you know, like how much notice or communicating those workloads or communicating that a campaign is coming up. Like it just helps create some transparency around the folks on the review team, sort of like what their workload looks like and can just help create some like common understanding and maybe open up some dialogue around giving some notice to the work given, you know, if there is really only one or two people responsible for a group's review, I think that's another conversation that this sort of data can, you know, jumpstart at the organization, which I think is hugely helpful for the whole team. Um, so, so many like good conversations that can come out of the group reviewer data. It's like I said, I think it's just like such an excellent set of data. So it's really fun. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So then um, moving right along, you know, maybe we're compelled to dig a little bit deeper and look on an individual performer basis. So it's interesting to review all employees who completed tasks on average slower than the overall company average, really just to illuminate if there are any breakdowns in the company processes where, you know, maybe not all employees are being supported and to also identify, you know, weak links or potential patterns or systemic issues. So um, let me take a look into this data and what stuck out. So as a reminder, the average for this company's um, you know, task completion is 2.4 days. And so this is just a sorted list of everyone that's beyond that um, organized in, in by group. And some of these folks have less tasks than others. So you have to look at this and sort of wait you know, the, the uh, relative uh, impact, I guess, for some of these folks. But what we can see um, is that a few people that do have a lot that are significantly more than the average, you know, maybe they need some attention. Maybe they need some training. There is something that we can take from this um, to illuminate, you know, I guess, potential performance gaps or, or um, challenges that these individuals may be facing and could use some more support from the organization. I mean, of course, my sort of eyes go to poor Nick Chen. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Maybe not poor Nick Chen, but I, that's, I mean, when you look For at the sure. data this way, there are some bigger numbers that sort of immediately cast or catch your eye in comparison to these others. I mean, in terms of the task per week and just the number of tasks, like that would be, I think everyone's eye would sort of immediately go to there and be like, oh, okay, like let's talk through this one in particular. Um, so curious, like how you would advise this organization or this customer to sort of talk through this 
that aspect in general. Cause like I said, I think it's just, it would catch your eye cause it's kind of an outlier here. Yeah, absolutely. I think it goes hand in hand with the prior slide. You know, I think when we called out one individual, one individual, mm-hmm. these, groups, these are those individuals. And yeah, I, I agree. Nick, poor Nick Chen, poor Janice Holland. Nick is supporting two functions. So they have, um, you know, and I guess this is for that three month period, um, which is why we sort of had like this tasks per week figure as well. Um, we pulled in this benchmark of 10 tasks per week as being kind of a good rule of thumb, a light benchmark as to a non-dedicated reviewer, you know, what's a reasonable amount of work that they should focus on completing per week. Obviously Nick Chen is almost four times that number. And again, maybe that's fine by design. Maybe that's this Nick Chen's only job, Um, but it does stick out. And obviously there is more work than they are able to keep up with the average, which it, which again, makes sense. It's giving us context into, you know, at this volume, of course, you're going to have longer task duration, or in this case, we believe that that's challenging his ability to, to get work done any faster than this, because he has a lot of it. What do we advise customers? Cause I, is there any sensitivity or like what, is there sensitivity in presenting user data to like the group? Like, do you typically advise customers maybe to start with those that are the process owners or, you know, the leadership folks within the process that can sort of take a look at this? Like, do we see any type of pushback to sort of like presenting this on a more public forum to the team, given like the names involved? I'm just curious, like not necessarily, like I can imagine that it's, again, it's good for communication and transparency, but do we advise customers around this at all in terms of like the level of detail that's sort of provided to maybe those that own or manage the process versus the participants? I would say that's almost always the, the audience that it's limited to, unless the culture of the organization is very open, then this data, you know, maybe is shared broadly. But I've I've seen customers with like varying degrees of um, treatment around this data and the sensitivity of it, um, even even down to like you know they don't want people to be able to get to this performance data within the platform. They really sure. want to kind of wall that off to process owners. I've also seen organizations use this data to inform things like performance reviews or you know employee goal um, achievement. So I think all of that is sensitive in nature. So yeah, mostly I see that that this level of reporting at the individual user level um, would not be very broadly broadcast and, and would be reserved for um, decision makers, process owners, department leads, people managers, and, and people that need this information on a need to know basis. Yeah, makes total sense. Okay. Okay. Should we move on? Let's do it. Okay. So that was on the review side of things, but what about on the submitter side? So the folks that are owning content that are submitting jobs for review, this is a similar drill down, um, but by those users. And what we're looking at here is again, folks that, um, I guess their average days incorporating feedback, which is kind of like their time sensitive task that gets assigned back to them. Um, when is that over the average, right? When is that more than 6.9 days? There's actually two sets of data here. This top table is that. This bottom table is when their average circulations exceeded the company's average. And remember, circulation is an attempt to get something reviewed and approved. If there's two of them, that means it went to the review team once, came back for revisions, and went back again before it was finally approved. So if you remember from the very first slide, the company's total average was 1.9. And so that's what these bottom four rows are in this table. So really two kind of vectors or or, um, sources, I guess, for these bottom performers. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, like the previous slide, the tasks the uh the job count here is important right it's it's relative to you know could that be an explanation for why it takes them a lot longer to incorporate feedback because they just have so many more of them going on um what else sticks out as interesting is that a couple of people you know complete their incorporating feedback very quickly. I would say mm-hmm. Natalia here 
but their average circulations is really high, which is an indicator that they might not be addressing all the feedback fully or they, in other ways, the quality of their content is not as good as their peers. So uh, that's a way to kind of um, pit against or I guess like understand the data uh, and what that could mean. It, like fast is not always better if ultimately it's requiring multiple circulations um, that slows the process down overall as well. Yeah, really good point. The feedback against the circulations is an important pairing here, right? Because it helps contextualize it. And I think the other piece that you know we included for the first time in our bench report, benchmarks report last year, which I think is applicable here, but tell me if I'm wrong, would be like the content type. So mm. perhaps do you layer on the conversation of perhaps the average, you know, the folks that are taking longer to incorporate that feedback, what is the content? Is it uh -huh. video? And that's going to, of course, take a little bit longer versus, you know, a social media post that would be quicker. And so that might, you know, would you agree that would be like an interesting layer onto this conversation? Is that, is that relevant here? I think so. I mean, I think with any analysis like this, the, the point is not to take bottom performers and, you know, take action against them or to immediately conclude that they're not performing. Uh, it, it is to really be the starting point for a conversation and to yeah. open up a discussion about, and maybe this is between a manager and the, and, and the user or between the process owner and the user or maybe it's more broad, you know, maybe it's not on an individual, but Hey, we're seeing this trend of, and it could be, like you said, when content is this type, it's taking significantly longer, um, to kind of protect the individual component of it. So, yeah, I think that's definitely part of it. And I think that it's just important to use this as a way to open up a conversation, to ask these folks who have maybe a higher at than at, higher than the average, what's going on or is there yeah. anything i can do to support you is there anything we can do as an organization to support you mm -hmm. um another thought is are, are there any correlations with the agencies that these people are working with um that data is not presented here uh, but could be another interesting slice that you know agency y is always slower than agency z which translates to higher costs for the organization and let's let's dig into that and figure out why yeah, really good point. It's just so fun. I don't know. Maybe this is just like because I'm a nerdy in this area, but like this data is like so interesting to look at. And to your point, like it's just such an excellent launch pad for so many different types of conversations that ultimately drive process improvements. So where should we go next? I'm excited to see where you sort of take us next. You know, actually, this was the end of the road. Um, Perfect. I, okay. Yeah, I just pulled, you know, again, some of the slides that were in this deeper analysis. So that was what I had to share today as far as the illustrative data goes. Okay, wonderful. So one sort of thing that you include, it's included in that high level slide at the beginning are benchmarks. So, mm -hmm. of course, we believe in benchmarking at Vidori. We release a benchmarks report each year. Talk me through incorporating benchmarks sort of in this type of data, like organizational data analysis, you know, how do, how do we talk about using benchmarks to like better understand your process? Yeah. I mean, I think that benchmarks are, it's sort of part of human nature to understand, you know, what good is for any sort of world you're operating in. And I think it's just such a rich opportunity that we have this data it flows through a system. Therefore, we under we, you know we can roll up this data. We can calculate benchmarks on, and they're just really necessary to help you anchor in, you know, what good could look like and how you can react to your own numbers. Mm -hmm. And is there any point where you feel like it almost feels like a? <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what you think about this question. You know, like. Where do organizations go wrong with benchmark comparisons? And the reason I hesitate is because like, we believe it's important. Like it is important to understand benchmarks because it contextualizes your own process. But is there maybe a misinterpretation of the benchmarks or a misapplication of the benchmarks to your own organization's data that can maybe 
miscolor things or drive organizations to look at things that maybe aren't as relevant? Like, can you like, just talk me through it? Like, where does this kind of go wrong or where would we advise mm -hmm. folks to sort of focus when it comes to the benchmark comparison? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think there's several um, pitfalls. I think number one, they aren't the answer. They shouldn't be your goal. Um, that definitely needs to be organization set. They can be used to inform your goal. They can be used as a North star, but there's always going to be unique things about an organization that should influence like their, your specific performance goals. Um, so they're directional at best pitfall would be just holding them up as, well, we definitely have to get to that um, because the constraints for any given organization are different. Um, and, and it really just needs to be a reference point in developing the organization's own goals. Mm -hmm. I think too, like one of the other very important, you know, reminders is that even when you're at benchmark, it doesn't mean like your process is perfect and that there's nothing to fix or solve. Um, so, or if you're outperforming the benchmark again, could that be a bad thing? Like we talked about with the speed right. to address feedback, but leading to higher circulations overall, then that's not a good thing. I think the third thing is focusing on vanity metrics, like the number of pieces that get produced in any given month. If that's all your organization cares about, even if you're looking at a benchmark or not, like you're sort of missing it. Like that's not, you know, more isn't always better. And it really, it really shouldn't be about just the number of widgets that got produced. It really should be about the quality of that process and better yet, the performance of that content in market and making sure we have this, this total loop. Yeah. Super helpful. I think those are just like important reminders because you can imagine that folks, you know, they, they see the benchmark and it's like, well, that's the end all be all. But to your point, there's a lot of other factors that should be considered. So I think that's super helpful. Okay. I mean, we looked at a lot of data today. We looked at like detailed views of the data, various permutations. Where should people start? Granted, like if this is the first time organizations are sort of pursuing driving process improvements with data, they might not have all of this, you know, um, excellent data at their fingertips. Where would you advise folks to start? Like where's a good baseline for looking at review data? Mm-hmm. Well, assuming that you are using a system and you can get access to that data in the system, you know, I think the baby steps would be looking at those sort of top level metrics that we presented at the very start, comparing those against Fedori's own benchmark report and just taking a pulse on where it is today, where things are today. Try to gain an understanding of where you are. If you've never looked at this before, um, you just really need to understand a baseline. From there, you can begin to set goals on how you want to see those numbers change. But first and foremost, understand it. I think then to ask leadership, what is, what's important for our organization? What is the goal? Is it speed? Is it quality? Is it efficiency in our process? Is it, um, and those are you know really, I think three of the primary ones to center yourselves around what should we be striving for? And how can we then monitor that over time to see if we're trending up or away from those goals? Perfect end. I loved it. Thank you so much. This was so fun and so informative and so actionable. I think just taking a look at the data and having you talk through it from sort of that expert perspective is just hugely um, informative and educational for the community. So thanks so much for coming on. Just really appreciate your time today, Jesse. Thanks for having me. And folks, the conversation doesn't stop here. Follow Vidori on LinkedIn for updates on new episodes. Join in on the conversation. We would love to hear ideas for new topics or questions you have to drive future episodes. You can subscribe to Amended Progress on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, this is Annalise signing off for Amended Progress. Have a fantastic day. 